Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we have guest chef Fermin Nunez. He's based out of Austin, Texas. He has two incredible restaurants. We talk about the origins of Chef's PSA and how he influenced it, how to run a successful restaurant, how to make sure you're getting the right brand deals. We call out some sponsors. The Michelin Guide coming to Texas. We tell some fun stories. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this one. Chef, it's good to see you, man. Very good to see you. So uh, I did a Q&A of people that wanted to ask you questions. Before, I was like, man, I'm going to have Fermin on. What's the most pressing question on everyone's mind and soft or hard? Soft. Soft, good. Good answer. Soft man. is the way to go. Do I Taco Bell soft? Soft, soft taco, <laughs> soft scramble. That's that's the way to, to my heart. Uh, good. You watch, um, do you watch The Bear? Yeah, I feel like it was my my chef civic duty to to watch it so I could have an opinion on it. Did you finish all three seasons? Unfortunately, yes. You did. See, I haven't even finished the third season. It was. It's a great thing to watch when you're in an airplane. Yeah. Just to like get it over with. What did What did you think? Man, I don't know. I have many opinions. Mm -hmm. I think the 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 first season was not my favorite. Yeah. The second one redeemed itself a little bit. I think it gave you an input on what it truly is to like open a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's 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 a show. They want to make drama, right? Like they have a story, but I think it really highlighted on like the 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 struggles of opening a restaurant. I think it's a little bit unrealistic in some parts. The third one, I don't think I'll ever get whatever those hours back in my life. The first episode, <laughs> like the first the first and second episode, I'm like, I I, I don't think I'm ever gonna get this hour. Was back the in first my life. episode where they're doing like the montage of him working? It like is at so Noma dramatic. And French Laundry. It is so and, dramatic. Yeah, yeah. And that it's... was the one episode I did like. Really? Yeah, that was the one episode I did like of the third season. And then after that, I just kind of lost my attention. I mean, it's it's a show, right? It's a drama show. It's like it's. I'm sure if you ask a doctor what they think about Doctor House, they'll be like, "It's very dramatic. It's not how it actually works." I'm sure you ask lawyers about law and order, they'll be like, "That is not how it actually happens." Finally, we get a show and and we get it something to say and yeah, I don't I don't I didn't necessarily agree with everything that they do. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I I that's that's my kind opinion. Yeah. Uh, about it. What about you? So the first season, well, in general, I think for someone that's a non-chef, like I have uh, friends that are non-chefs, family members that are non-chefs, they love it. Like, oh my god, this is so cool. And I'm like, eh, it's okay. Like. The first season when I watched it, it's the first time I've ever watched a TV show. And there was a scene where uh, the tickets are going, wheels fall off the bus busy. While I was sitting down watching it, I stood up because I wanted to call call tickets. Like I stood up and I was pacing. And uh, I was like, calm down. What, what am I doing? The show is getting me worked up. And the thing about the That's show. That's kind of a good sign. Yeah, right? So it was, it was in a bad way because it's like these guys don't know what the fuck they're doing. Those right. dudes don't even sell food until like the seventh episode. It <laughs> right. takes them so long. <laughs> yeah. They have somebody on payroll that is fixing things. Yeah. That doesn't work. Yeah, right? You have to watch like five episodes for him to be in the weeds to like figure out how to sell food in to-go boxes. And he's making sandwiches. It's he's like, making sandwiches. Relax. And, and I'm looking at all this and then someone asked me like, is it true that all this stuff happens? Like, yes, it is true, but it doesn't all happen in one day. It probably, that like you're seeing chaos that's like, a three-year montage of every chef's worst stories condensed into an episode. It's like, it, does, it doesn't really happen like that. When I got to the second season, um, again, I didn't like the first season, to be honest with you. It was okay. It was just okay. Second season, I was getting a little bit into it. Third season, I liked the first episode. Unlike you, I did like the first episode. Why? Season. Why did you like it? Um, because of Chef's PSA, right? Because everything that he's doing, like cutting the tape, refixing things in the cooler, um, cleaning with the skewer on the stove. Like, these are all things that I write about. I agree, but it's so dramatic in how they're going about it. And I think it's going, it's taking a step backwards into how we are going about, it's cool to cut the tape. It's cool to clean between the creases with a toothpick. It's not cool to be an asshole. And they're highlighting that. But did they show the asshole stuff? I think they're just like so pretentious on like, you know, how they're going about it. It's like, oh, this is the way and you have to suffer about it. No, like you can cut the tape and like still have a good time and you don't have to look like, you know, so intense about it. So, yeah, he looked like so he was, was going to jump off a bridge and after oh. cutting the tape. But 
that was my favorite episode was the first one because I, I liked it, right? I like seeing Danielle and Thomas and visually Renee. it yeah, was it was, it was like, nice to see. Dave and I Baron. guess and I guess that's how they got me, right? It's like I didn't love it because there was no story to it. It was just like chef life. We're gonna yeah. clean, we're gonna scrub, we're gonna cut the tape, we're gonna go over here, like we're gonna go learn how to do this thing at Noma, we're gonna go to you know the French laundry, we're gonna go to New York and it's like cool. See, but to me that's what I was geeking out about. Yeah, because I like the story is uninteresting. Like I don't care about the girlfriend. I don't care about. I, I don't remember if it was second season or third season where like they're the. I, I think her name is Sydney, the sous chef. Mm-hmm. She's arguing with someone like a boyfriend, yeah. girlfriend argument in the middle of the like opening night. Like that doesn't happen. Like what in what restaurant do we allow them to have a personal petty argument in the middle of service? And he comes up and is like, hey, I know it's now now is not a good time. Like you think the opening night. And also, I don't remember which episode this was, but like opening night, I don't know if it's season two or season three, opening night, he's going to try dessert for the first time that's going on the menu. Like, come on, you're, try- you're seeing a dessert for the first time that's going on the menu for your first restaurant ever, 30 minutes before the restaurant opens. Like, I don't think that's the way it works. I'm sure the chef had fucking ironed out every single detail before opening night. So some of that stuff kind of, eh, whatever, I get it, it's TV, but uh, um I haven't finished the third season. I've been watching it for like eight months, ten months, a year. I I, I think yeah, I think you have to finish seeing it just but, to get it out of my system. Yeah, just to get it. Are out Are they of gonna way. do a fourth season? I think so. Maybe yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you're gonna be on it. I don't know. I don't. I don't think I'll be doing that do anytime the, soon. The, I don't the, think the montage you're making. Not for not with everything I just said about <laughs> how I feel about it. Maybe they'll come like do an episode where Jeremy Allen White's getting grilled on the Chef's PSA. I podcast. love that. Yeah. I love that. Like why why are you so, why are you such a nerd? Why are you so intense? Relax, <laughs> yeah, relax, brother. Your why, shirt is like one hundred fifty dollars. You're doing fine. Yeah, why are you so weird, brother? Exactly. <laughs> you know. I'll tell you what I did learn about that, and this is what I think a lot of people could learn about the show The Bear, is that guy shouldn't be running a restaurant. I agree. Like that guy, uh, her his his sous chef CDC. I forget her name. She's yeah. the one that should yeah. be doing it. Yeah. And I think that's one one good thing that the show highlights is it it highlights how much like chefs or executive chefs the tv chefs don't actually run the show they yeah. they create more problems than they fix sometimes right sometimes yeah yeah so speaking of creating problems that they don't fix and you know the chef running the show i want to ask you about this because i think it's pretty cool you're one of uh you're one of the best chefs in austin you have two of the best restaurants very kind of you well i mean it right two of the best restaurants in austin with suerte and este and uh both very similar, but also very different in style and food and cuisine. When I first went to S, no, when I first went to Suerte years ago, uh, when you first opened, I remember trying the food and I was like, I'm a technique geek. Like, that's why Chef's PSA is like, I, I love technique. I love to see beautiful technique. I love attention to detail. And I remember, and I also love Mexican food. Like, that's, that's what I grew up eating. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I tried the food, I just remember thinking like, you nailed it because this is Mexican food with exceptional technique, exceptional technique. And I just, I just remember I was sitting back and I was like, man, the onions were cur- cut perfect. The sauce was smooth. I don't know if you were passing it through a tammy or what you were doing, but everything was just beautiful and technical and delicious, but also approachable. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. I just want to you know, give you your flower chef. Thing. Appreciate so, that. Thank you. So two of the best restaurants, but, uh, you're the chef of both of these restaurants and, uh, I mean, they're not that close. You can't walk to each one back and forth. You can't. So what does a day-to-day in the life of you look like managing two different restaurants? Do you have uh, two different chef de cuisines? What what kind of leadership do you give to both of them? What does the operation look like? What is your role in this? So that's a very good question that I'm trying to figure out myself. Uh, We have those two amazing restaurants, Suerte Este. We also have Bartotti, which is right next to Este, which started as like an event space when we opened Este and then... A little bit of a bar food that just happened to be open on Friday and Saturdays uh, that now turn into a restaurant that is seven days a week with a CDC and a sous chef. And, you know, it's it's another and it's another thing that I that I got to be in charge of. And I think the more I realize what my role is, Mm -hmm. is it's more of like similar to how you talk about when you were running the, the hotel. Right. Like you had your people in charge and I make the biggest impact on the restaurants through my connection with those people. My Tuesdays, which are my Mondays, start with meetings with all the key leaders in the restaurants 
because that's how I'm able to know what's going on in every kitchen because I'm not able to be in the kitchen every single day, every single time, right? I always describe this to the cooks that, you know, if, if we're in an airplane, the CDCs are the pilots. They're the ones that are steering the plane in the right direction. They can see everything that's happening on board. They can talk to their sous chefs. They can see what's going on. They, they have the people that are in the dining room. They're seeing it down day to day, but I'm the one on the ground mm -hmm. being able to direct them on how we're going to get there. This is what I see ahead. This is what we've got to work on. This is the thing that I want um, us to focus on. These are the things that we got to start preparing because we're seeing the busy season, right? So I'm not the pilot anymore. They are the pilots and they have full control to fly the plane with my direction. And that's a little bit more of what I do on a day to day. I always try to have like, oh, today I'm going to be at Suerte, today I'm going to be at Este, and then today, tomorrow I'm going to be at Bartotti. It never really works out that way, right? The restaurants tell me where I need to be, uh, and they don't care about where I want to be, right? So that's that's a little bit of what my role is on the day to day, and and checking in with those key people. I have a CDC mm -hmm. per restaurant, and not counting Toti, uh, every CDC has three sous chefs, mm -hmm. and then I have a pastry chef. Uh, Derek Flynn, who runs the the desserts for all the restaurants, right? That's like eight, nine, nine, ten people that I have to constantly like be aware of. And then I don't know all the cooks, right? Like I remember you talk about uh, in your podcast about what it was like for you running the hotel, and I and I resonate a lot with that because it's like you connected with the people that were running it, so they could then lead on the rest of the people that you might not necessarily be interacting with a lot, right? So it's 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 getting to a point for me that it's kind of weird to like. I walk into the restaurant and I don't necessarily know the person that just got hired. I only know about them through the notes that I've heard about. And then I introduce myself to them where five years ago, I was the one that was interviewing all those people and I was making decisions who was going to get hired. And now I get to be like, Hey, my name is Fermin. Welcome to the team. I'm excited that you're here. You so know, do you, do you like it more that way? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I like it because I get to see, the growth that I was going through that got me to be where I am. And it also allows me to do other things that I wasn't able to do because I was just focusing on the day to day. Right. So, so you feel yeah. like you have more growth now in what you're doing, like you're different challenges, different challenges. Yeah. Different challenges for sure. I focus more on running the business than running the kitchens. Mm. So I was talking with uh, Jacob on a couple of podcasts ago, and uh, we were talking about advice that I had given him when he had taken over as executive chef of Garrison. And I was on my way out, and I told him, I said, look, a chef de cuisine can run a good kitchen. A, 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 an executive chef can run a great restaurant. And so there, there's a certain point when you're growing as a chef that you say, hey, it's not just about the kitchen anymore. It's about, it's about everything. Everything becomes important. So um, was there one thing when you were in the growth phase that was a little bit harder to adapt to for you? That part of like understanding the big picture, that was really hard for me. But, you know, like back in the day, things that were harder were only harder because I made them harder. And 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 navigating that now with my CDCs, it's like, hey, we got to do this catering because this catering is going to make sure that we have a, a healthy business when it's slow, mm. right? And, and that that really was a big challenge for me to like it, when I was just running the kitchen, when it was just me and, and a few sous chefs, um, I'd be like, now we're too busy to be doing catering. Right. But now that I can step out of it and look at it as a big picture, like you said, I remember when, when, when you were talking with Jacob about that, I was like, that's exactly how I feel. I am running the, the restaurant as a business and I'm not, I'm just not running the kitchens. And that was a big thing for me to realize and like, Oh, this is this is what I have to do now. This is my role. I don't have to worry about who's going to make the schedule and who's going to work the grill on Tuesday. If the Tuesday grill guy or girl doesn't show up, I can help out and, you know, fix those problems and I look like a badass, right? But that is not my dude anymore. I have way too big of a payroll to be focusing on those things. I got to focus on the bigger thing to make sure that we have a healthy business. It's interesting. You bring up a really interesting point how if the grill cook calls off, can you jump on the grill and fix it? Yeah. Should you? Probably not. That's not the best use of your time. Um, but it's interesting when sometimes young cooks come in, it's like, 
why doesn't chef work the grill anymore? Like I thought he's the executive chef. Why does, why isn't he on the grill? We had a call off call Fermin. Um, and it's like, yeah, I, I, I understand that that's sometimes what you think when you're a cook, but it's, bigger picture that that's and the when those things like happen when it's like when when i get the phone call i know that they've gone through all the things that they have to do to like give me the call and that's exciting to me because that to me is like i put all the things that i'm working on on hold to just focus on like running the pass or working a station yeah. right or like doing the prep list or butchering the fish that's like that's the exciting days that i don't get a lot of every now and then but when those happen i'm like this is it when um when you're developing menus for the two restaurants how often do you change we change as needed we don't really have like uh we change the whole menu every three to four months right um with the seasonality in austin mm -hmm. it doesn't also really happen that way right it changes based on we have the menu structure to where like we have the things that are never going to go away right yeah. we're never going to take the sueros out from suerte like that wouldn't be financially uh, a very smart move for us to do that. Right. But we have a quesadilla on the menu, right? And the quesadilla, the filling changes as much as the uh, season changes. If we're doing it with a summer squash, we'll run it until one or two things happen. We get bored of that set or there's no more squash, mm. right? And then we change it to whatever we're excited about in the moment. And we have little things like that throughout both all the restaurants. There's like we have a format that works and and the ingredient the ingredients are the ones that change that is one way when when we change menus and then another thing is like the drastic reality of like if somebody doesn't like something and if one person doesn't like it it's okay but if you're getting constant feedback about that one dish where it's either getting sent back or like people don't finish it or mm -hmm. you see it in the notes of this person didn't like this that is that is more of my what role is now right? it's like hey the halibut we're having issues with it uh people are not liking it maybe we should change the fish or we constantly see that the halibut is being returned because it's undercooked people like the the dish as a set but we're having a struggle with cooking it well maybe we, we butcher it a different way maybe we don't cut it a stick maybe we uh poach it a little bit in the back. so it's like th those are a little bit more like what my day-to-days -day are and how the menu is a little bit of changing towards um towards how, what the people want right so you take a very strategic approach when uh doing menu development so you're looking at like hey this works like you're saying the quesadilla but like how do we adjust it to make it either more exciting more seasonal something like that um when you're free-spirited creating a, a menu like when when you were doing este before este opened what is your creative process when you're thinking about okay how do we design this restaurant to be what it is i think it's that always starts with a dream, right? You always want to start with like what you're passionate about. And that was how we did Suerte, how we did uh, Este, how we went about Bartotti. You start with your dream and then the restaurant, as it started to be coming alive and there's people coming in and out, it will tell you what needs to change, right? We went through that with Suerte. We went through that with uh, Este. We went through that with Bartotti. I had my dream of what I wanted to serve. And then you figure out compromises, right? It's like, mm -hmm. I love this one dish at Este that it was like so, not even controversial. Like the people that liked it, loved it. The people that didn't, hated it. They were not about it. And it was tuna carnitas. And to me, that was a special dish. That was I like, had it. It was good. That was like really special to me because of like the connection that I had to it. Like where I tried it in Mexico the first time is very like, it's not very common. You don't associate tuna with cooking it in far and, and, and cooking it in lard. Yeah. Um, people usually associate tuna with like being like raw or like barely see on the outside. Uh, and the people that liked it loved it. The people that didn't didn't. So it was like, do I think this dish is better than what it actually is? Is it hurting the restaurant more than what it should be? Mm -hmm. Is it time for me to just move on and create something that is gonna uh, be loved by more people than half and half? You mm -hmm. know. So that was that's something too that like. I always say, like, when you open restaurants, like, you see what your dream is, and then you realize what you can afford. So, uh, talking about opening a restaurant and fresh in your memory, because how long has uh, Este been open? This is going to be two in October. So, still pretty fresh in memory, and then, and sweat to before that, how, how old? Six and a half. Six and a half. So, you've opened three restaurants in the last six years, give or take. Um, for someone that's about to open up their first restaurant, never opened it before, it's their first time at bat. What is some advice that you wish you knew that you're going to help this new chef? 
that's I, listening. I think if it's in Austin, the biggest thing that I've learned in the last six years, as opposed to um, before, Austin is such a, a a more of a seasonal city than it's ever been. And if you're not prepared to be um, slow, if you're not thinking about those four months out of the year where there are not going to be a lot of people just in Austin, there's going to be a lot of people coming in. You got, you got to think about that. You know, the food, if you're at the point where you're like, I'm going to open my restaurant, like the food you probably like figured out, right? The more restaurants that I've opened, the more I realize that the food is the easiest part and is the last thing I think about now. It's about how much money I'm going to put in to make sure that I get all that money back. Mm-hmm. You know, you might not need the rational to open because those $30,000 are going to be better in the bank so you can make payroll, so you can buy produce, right? I swear to you, we opened with two Blodgett ovens, double stacked. Mm-hmm. You know, the dream was always irrational, but we couldn't afford the dream. And that didn't stop me from making tasty food, right? There's like right. that saying, like uh, Sam Helman Mass, who's my business partner in the restaurant, always says, uh, you can get a great pair of scissors, give it to a shitty barber, you're going to still get a shitty haircut. Yeah. No? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think I think a lot of people underestimate how good you have to be at cooking before you think about opening your restaurant because the last thing you need to worry about is your cooking needs to be on autopilot, right? You got to be able to create food, and like you were talking earlier, you got to be nimble enough to adjust and say, "Hey, the halibut's not selling," or uh, "Too many complaints because it's undercooked." Like, it's, let's adjust. And then, what's interesting about a restaurant is you. I, I know you know what I'm talking about. Like when you first open. It's, it's not, you're not performing at your best because you need more cooks in the kitchen. Um, and a lot of them are going to quit because it gets hard, right? There's, mm-hmm. there's attrition, there's turnover. Um, and then you get more efficient. So what you opened with, I'm just making this up. If you open with 12 cooks on the line, you might end up with eight when you're efficient, right? Um, and you really hit your stride a couple months in, but it sucks because a lot of people come into a restaurant, they try you in your first month and say, I wasn't great. I'm, or yeah, I got it. I'm not coming back. No, no. Try it at first, come back after they got their sea legs, and then come back maybe even a year later, and it's not the same restaurant. I've got a very hot take on that. You know, like, everybody only wants to ever talk about the best new restaurant, the hot new restaurants in town, right? And there's all these lists that are driven by that. And those things are, like, such a good thing and a bad thing, in my opinion, right? Mm -hmm. They're a good thing because if you're in that list, it's going to make sure that your restaurant is successful because people are going to be excited to try it, Right. But why is there's not like a best five year old and up restaurant? Right. Because a lot of those those restaurants that are on those lists, five years later they're not even open, no matter how great they were at cooking, right? And I think it's like it's so hard to judge a restaurant the first three six months because I always describe it as like the first year of opening a restaurant you're gathering your data, like you said you overstaff with with uh, with cooks you overstaff with staff just because you never put away the sugar. For the first time, you don't get better at something uh, by doing it only one time. You get better at it by doing it over and over again. You figure out where the sugar is going to be, where the onions are going to be, right? So you need a lot more people to do that. Mm-hmm. And people have never done the recipes more than once, right? So you gather all your data. You also know what people are going to order after that year, right? You figure out when the busiest time of the day, like how you structure the prep cooks coming in, the the line cooks coming in, like the dishwashers, right? You gather all your data in the first year, and then the second year, you implement that to be better. So it's like year three, you're like you're hitting your stride. Yep. You know, I always say like suerte is as best it's ever been right now because of all the five years before it that got us to where we are. Mm-hmm. I think best new restaurants are cool, but like five year old restaurants and up are way cooler in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring this up because uh, I did a podcast. I don't know. Let's let's call it eight months ago. It was called Best Old Restaurant. I was at, uh, I think I was at Este, and I was with um, uh, Emmanuel LaRoche from Flavors Unknown, the host of the podcast. And we were talking. You came to the table, and we talked about Best Old Restaurant. I was like, okay, I'm going to do a whole podcast on it. I don't know if you heard it, but I did a whole podcast based on the conversation nice. that we had, Best Old Restaurant. Uh, it's about 20 or so episodes back, but you should go listen to it. I, I will. Because I, I, I did mention, I don't know if I mentioned that I got the idea from you, but I mentioned like I was talking to someone. And I don't always say who I get, you know, unless you give permission. Uh, one thing that I also want to touch on that before uh, we move on, and, and just because I have the microphone on Chef's PSA, you know, I think one thing that you touched on is like to open a restaurant, you can't not be good at the basis of cooking. And one of the things that I've been recently talking about at lineups with all the cooks, right? It's like every restaurant has this issue. 
People forget to fill out the prep list correctly. People forget to pull the shrimp. People forget to pull the thing from the freezer that is going to make sure that the prep list is, is great the next day. Soaking the beans to make bean puree. It's like every restaurant has these problems, right? And I always tell these cooks, like every single person in this kitchen most likely wants to be a chef. How can I trust you to order the produce for the restaurant if you can't order the things that you need for your prep list to be successful? So all the people that are watching Chefs PSA, if you want to be a good chef, like focus on the things when you're cooking that are going to be the building blocks of being a great chef yep. by knowing how to prioritize your day, how to fill out a prep list correctly, how to do the things that are going to make the next day easier. Because when you're a chef, those are all the building blocks. If you if you don't know how to order the right amount of Bermonte or whatever it is that you're asking for the next day, how are you as a chef going to know how many pounds of onions to order for the restaurant to be successful. If you can't have your station be successful, that's it. You can use AI. <laughs> I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Your use, favorite. Use AI to write your prep list. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do use AI. What, do you use AI at all in the restaurant right now? No, I think I'm too, like, dumb to figure that out. Really? Yeah. You're not. I don't, Technology is not my forte. Yeah? Uh, but it's like... Your social I, media, for people that are listening, your social media is one of the, my favorite ones to watch. It has nothing to do with AI. I mean, it's, you know how to use your phone. You, you, if you can have a conversation with me, you can have a conversation with a robot. I, 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 this, is my, this is my thing with AI. I think, I think it's something that we got to be able to know where to draw a line and how to take advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, you've worked with rational ovens, yep. right? Um, I always give this analogy with, with our cooks, right? Let's make sure that we take advantage of all these things. Like the rational ovens can clean themselves. Mm -hmm. You put a tablet, you push a button, and it cleans itself. Right. That is time that we're gaining as humans that we're not spending scrubbing the oven that we can make sure to be better at utilizing that time, creating, or like cutting the onions a little bit nicer. Like all those things, let's take advantage of that. And I think AI is a tool that we can have mm -hmm. to be able to help us balance that on the time of like, Maybe if AI can help us figure out how to like do the schedule, we gain that hour into being more creative on mm -hmm. making new dishes, mm -hmm. right? If AI can help us making sure that we structure the prep list a little bit better, that is like you fill out this thing and it just generates what you need for the next day, we gain 30 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour for whatever else we can do that AI can yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, as someone who uses AI a lot, because Chef's PSA is almost a one-person operation, and I do a lot. Um, and I got to the point uh, about a year ago where in order for me to grow the podcast, write more books, create more content, uh, do more consulting, public speaking, like everything that I do with this business, um, I was like, I need to probably hire like four people. And I was like, I was at a crossroads. because like, I don't, I don't know how I'm going to scale this business by myself. Uh, and it wasn't generated enough money for me to hire four people to help me. Then AI comes along and what used to take me 10 hours a day probably takes me like three with AI. Um, the amount of writing that I have to do, editing, formatting, uh, it's exponentially more efficient. Um, and so now that extra seven hours, uh, sometimes I use it just to fuck off. But now I use it to, to work on more things. So I'm exponentially more um, productive now with AI than I was without it. It didn't replace my creativity because I think that's some of the arguments that mm -hmm. I get from chefs like, oh, it's going to replace your creativity. It's, it's not. It opens up more creativity. It, it, I'm actually on the opposite. Creative. I'm actually more creative with AI yeah. um, because I'll, if I'm consulting for a restaurant, which um, not build AI chatbots for them, like recipe development, I'll say, you know, I want my recipes to look like this in grams listed with the first ingredient and the first method. I, I want a short sentence. Um, and maybe I need a recipe for a mole, right? It's like, give me a mole, make sure it has this type of chiles in it, uh, make sure it has uh, these spices in it, and make sure it yields this. Like, the recipe's not perfect when I get it, but I can hand it off to a cook in the kitchen and say, use this as a base, adjust with your notes and what your intuition tells you when you're using the force, the chef force, right? And then bring it back to me and it's like, that in itself, and I could scale that out with 20 recipes and hand it to 20 different cooks. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of time that it would have taken me to write 20 recipes is like, I mean, I type with two fingers. So, um, yeah, AI has made me exponentially more efficient. And one of the things I was talking to someone is like you could also create food images, mm -hmm. right? And 
how good AI is now, like you can't tell the difference between, is it a real photograph or was that created with AI? And so if like, if you're like, hey, I have this menu idea. It's like, okay, so you plug it into an image generating software and you're like, make me a sea bass um, with peas and, you know, pea tendrils or whatever and a green sauce and a green oil. And then it pops it out and you say, played it like a Michelin three-star chef. Or you could say, played it like a Michelin three-star chef in Tokyo, right? So it'll spit out a different you, you look. You should do a little like this or that on Instagram oh, I, I do and, see, and yeah. see if people know which one's AI and it's which one's not. It's about 50-50. Really? Yeah, 50-50. And, and what's funny is people know I use AI and it's like, come on, I, I shouldn't be fooling you guys this easy. Like you guys know it's, it's going to most likely be AI, but a lot of people still fall for it. Um, and so you can take these images now. It's like, okay, it gives you an idea. Like it's a good starting point. I was telling, um, I don't know if I should share this on the podcast. Do it. Because I'm going to talk shit. So I'm not a big fan of apron companies. Okay. Right? I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of expensive aprons. I'm a, give me the blue Brigard apron. They're not $35. The yeah, like, uh, give me the blue apron and I'm set, right? Um, I'm not going to pay a 100 whatever dollars to look cool with an apron. I always say, like, no one ever comes into the restaurant and says, hey, their food would be better if they only had cooler aprons. Like It goes back to the scissor comment, right? Back to the scissor comment. And so um, I created some uh, AI images of chefs, and these chefs were wearing cool aprons. I was like, these fucking aprons are pretty cool, right? So I sent it to our mutual friends uh, over at Maiden. I was like, if you ever want to get at the apron game, like this is the one. This, this is the one. But and they said we'll make a fish basket instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so which leads to an interesting thing, right? Because there's a fish basket story. There's a so fish basket in the world. I want to ask you about one of the things that I think is very important for chefs is aligning themselves and positioning themselves as a chef for marketing, for branding, um, and who they are as a chef, right? So I think this is very important. Who you are on social media, um, you're telling a story always, right? Your personal brand is out there. You've done a really good job at this. I want some advice for the people that are listening. How do you position yourself with marketing, branding, and allow all that? But before you get into that, tell us the fish basket story for people that the don't. The fish know. basket story started with uh, their friends are made, and they, you know, I think they're just like, it's always very polite when people are like, oh, yeah, I want to help you out. Like, you know, what are you, what do you think it's out there that is, that is not great? And without thinking, I always, I, I've never seen a good fish basket out there that was like of quality. Uh, so I told them fish basket. And then I just started like, long story short, I just started poking at them for like over a year to like make a fish basket. Because in my mind, I was like, you already make pans. You yeah. know where to get the steel from. Just make a thing that closes and it doesn't break and like put it over charcoal and it, and it and it's and it's done, right? So I just started poking at them like, when is a fish basket? You know, and like they would be very generous and bring saute pans to the, to the restaurant, bring pots for the cooks. Uh, and I'd be like, yeah, this is cool, but it's not a fish basket, right? So uh, it just kind of like went on and on and it became this bit that it actually turned into something. Uh, and through being part of that process, I realized that making a quality fish basket is way harder than it seems like. Mm. Uh, but now that's the fish basket that we use at the restaurant and we use a lot of it uh, because we have dishes at Este that are required to like be in a basket and be cooked directly in coals. Mm -hmm. uh, and we love it. And now you can also buy one too online if you want to. Do you have, do you have royalties? I do not. I'm not going to sell it. Buy the Heston fish basket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't know if Heston makes a fish basket, but uh, anyway. So the second part to that question is how do you, how do you position yourself as a chef today? Like what would be advice to people that are listening of how they should position themselves for marketing, branding, um, and creating an identity online because I mean, everything's online right mm -hmm. now. Um, and then, so how would they do it? But also how do you do it? Man, I think that's, that's something that it's very new, right? When, when you and I started cooking, like social media was not a thing, right. you know, it was you, if you wanted to learn about chefs, like you go on the internet and then maybe order a book and then have to wait actually two weeks for it to get there. Or go to the library. So like now it's very uh, different, and to like you can see what every chef is up to, and pretty much is social media is your 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 new resume, right? If if you're a chef and you want to um, do things of quality and, and and all those things, and I think the biggest thing I've learned along the way with all the recognition from the restaurants that I've gotten is it's it's two main things, right? It's those things of partnerships and marketing only come from 
will, in my in my case, come from the success of the restaurant. So it's something that I never want to forget, right? I never want to just be like an Instagram chef uh, and people come to the restaurant. They're like, oh, that's not good, right? Because the opportunities that have come my way have all come because of the restaurant that my name is attached to. And I'm very proud of that. And another big thing that I think is it's more for everybody out there. Not every opportunity, it's a good opportunity. And that's hard to digest sometimes because you might see an email that might pop in your inbox or on Instagram that is like, we're going to give you this many thousand dollars to do a video promoting, I don't know, sour cream, right? It's a nice paycheck. You've worked, you know, multiple hours making nine, 12, 15, $20 an hour. And now this company is giving you, let's say $10,000 just to like do a post about how amazing their sour cream is. That sounds very tempting, right? Mm. But do you want your name to be associated with sour cream if you don't even like sour cream, if you don't use sour cream at your restaurant, right? It's like the price that you're paying for that is way more expensive than the $10,000 that you're getting immediately. So I think it's better to understand what you believe in and commit to those things and the right opportunity will come. Money is such a like evil thing that when people start reaching out to you just to throw it at you, you have to be very strong minded on what you believe in because that's your brand is, is something that like, that's what people are following you for. Right. Right. If you start just selling yourself short for the bigger paycheck immediately, then you're not going to get maybe the bigger opportunity later on. Right. We're made in slits on your DM, DMs and it's like, hey, we're going to give you royalties for every fish basket. We you got to be a, uh, uh, an influencer. To right. Get made in money. These so days. it's like they don't that's... sponsor the podcast made in. I'm going to look directly into the camera for <laughs> for Jake and Chip. That's that's a, I think <laughs> there, that's a, there's a local Austin podcast up the street from the made in office that made in doesn't sponsor. <laughs> you hear it here first. Hot take. <laughs> uh, that's that's the hard part. Right. It's like. You don't know what you're missing out of by signing a deal with somebody that you might not be super pumped to to be a part of just to get an initial paycheck. The biggest chef's podcast is in Austin up the street from Maiden with your old friend Andre. Worldwide. Your old friend Andre who you've known Former for years. customer. Former customer set you up. <laughs> anyway. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I love those guys. I'm just giving them shit. I'm trying to get a fish basket deal. Maybe a, a, a free fish basket. We'll get you a fish basket. I can get a fish we'll basket. We'll get you a fish basket. I did a, uh, like an oyster demo for them once there. You can find it on YouTube. I, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, now very, 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 now, very now good hands. Very good hands, right? So now they're putting out uh, uh, oyster um, videos. Like, where's my video? Where's my video? Where, where are the royalties for that video? Where are the royalties for my video? Maiden, come on. What's going on? Um, all joking aside, I agree with what you're saying for people that are listening. Um, I would only be sponsored by people that actually like their product and use their If product. you want to hang out with them on a Sunday afternoon, that's the people you want to be yeah. doing deals with. Yeah, I, I, I don't want a sponsor that's, uh, you know, no offense to Daisy Sour Cream. I mean, I do eat it at home, but Ugh. but I'm not gonna, I'm not going to, like, sit up here and say, like, oh, go buy this brand of sour cream or whatever, right? But, like, I smoke these cigars. I will... I, I will gladly something that feels natural, right? And yeah. I, and then think even then, like looking at the contract and having a professional lawyer look for it, because you know when you see just like oh this is how much money they want to pay me, and you don't see the fine print, and that fine print they might own your name, which is called likeness yeah. for perpetuity, which means forever, Ooh. and they can have it for whatever use they have because you signed a piece of paper that said that they could. So understanding that, right? Like understanding all those terms and the best way yeah. to do that, if you're a chef, you probably didn't go to law school. If you did, then you're saving some money, but have a professional lawyer look for it. Because another thing that I've learned too, just kind of like with not every opportunity is a good opportunity. Every time somebody reaches out to you with those things in mind, they have, you, you have negotiating power. Yeah. Right? It's like, oh, maybe maybe it's not in the money wise, but maybe it's in the contract. Maybe you don't have my image and likeness for six months. Maybe we'll just keep it at three months. You know, so there's always room for negotiation when you are looking at those brands. You're just like, well, there's always room for negotiation when you're looking for a new job. So I put out a podcast the other day and I talked about Michelin and inspections. And then I brought it up a couple of times now since on some different podcasts that I was in a restaurant. And I'm like 90 percent sure I sat next to a Michelin inspector. What people don't know is that was your restaurant. 
and it was me texting you saying, hey, I think I sat next to a Michelin inspector. And you're like, haha, you would say that. Um, but with Michelin coming, I guess my first question is, was that a Michelin inspector? Do you know? And I have sec- no idea. Second question is, what do you think of Michelin? So, I mean, a little bit of background. I, I listen to you, your podcast and I text you every now and then, you know, like, so it's, it's, it's on my rotation of things I listen to. And I was listening to that and I was like, oh, that's funny. Like, I, I know the backstory that, it, right? And then, and then you went into like, how would you go about opening a restaurant in Michelin Star, right? And I have my, my opinions on that. But I think first, and to talk about the Michelin Guide, I think generally it's a good thing that it's coming to Texas, right? Um, I'm nervous about some things that might happen from it coming to Texas, about some negative things that might happen, you know, where it dis- disrupts the, the community, you know, where people might be mad about some people getting something or uh, cities being like talking shit amongst each other, which I don't think is there's anything positive from that. Mm-hmm. I think there's positive things that come from it. We're attracting new talent, mm-hmm. attracting new customers. Those are always positive things. And I think, you know, it's like, I never thought that Texas would be in the Michelin Guide. And that's that's kind of cool. Do you think a Michelin star in Texas dangles a carrot for a lot of chefs to change the way that we operate restaurants? And the reason I ask that is because I've been to Michelin star restaurants. I've eaten at Michelin star restaurants. I have a lot of friends that are Michelin star chefs. Um, and when you go to these restaurants, there's a, there's, there's a difference. There's a mm-hmm. difference in the way the restaurant feels in the terms of the elements of luxury, you know, the china, the glassware, the stemware, um, the flow of service, tasting menu only. Like I did a, I did a report when I was still a chef um, of restaurants that had stars that offered tasting menu only. Um, and it was like, I don't remember what it was off the top of my head, but I think it was like 90% of all of them have a tasting menu, something like that. It was, it was a ridiculous number. Like when, when you start getting into that category, do you think it's going to incentivize chefs for the, for, the, for the thrill of the star to change who they are? That's my biggest fear, that people start cooking for the guide and not with a true, honest point of view. And that was a little bit of my hot take on how you would go about going for a Michelin star in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. That is my biggest fear, that people change everything about what they might believe in, that they might already be doing, just to cook for a few people that might come throughout the year to maybe give you something, maybe not. Right. And I think also based on the information, or not the information, just what's out there from the guide now, it's changed a lot. And I think they are looking for a stronger point of view that is unique rather than the fine dining and the fork and the water and the coffee service, right? And the tasting menu. I think just like just seeing the the, the latest guides, the California one just released where um, Amarisco's restaurant got a star, mm-hmm. right? Um, I don't know that restaurant. Uh, okay. But it's in, a, it's in a food stall. Mexico City. They got a star. Yeah, they got a star. Okay. And they're not a tasting menu restaurant. But they have a very strong point of view. Whole books. They have a very strong point of view on what they're serving. Mm -hmm. And it's not just necessarily tasting menu. And so the taco shop in Mexico. The taco shop in Mexico probably doesn't doesn't even have a restroom. Mm -hmm. They have like three things on the menu. Right? So I think for me, like, that is more of what they are looking for. Just based on the things that I'm seeing on who's getting the stars. Than maybe the old school way of going about it. And, like, I've heard stories of restaurant remodeling just so they could have a nicer restroom so they could get their third star. Mm-hmm. To me, that changes the reason of why we get into cooking for, for in the first place. And also, we're in Texas. You know, I, it's, it's, it's not New York. It's not, it's not Madrid. It's not Barcelona. It's not Tokyo. Mm-hmm. We, we got to cook for the people that are going to come in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And those are probably not going to be Michelin inspectors can I, year-round. Can I, can I push back on something that you said? Yeah. So you mentioned the, the bathroom, right? Um, and I know that's not why we got into cooking, but when we're talking about creating a restaurant, sometimes when you go to a a restaurant that you want to say is exceptional in all regards, and when you, when you think about excellence in the terms of all regards, nothing is off, off the table. That means, is it two ply or is it single ply? Right. So, I mean, sometimes like I could see why some of these chefs are thinking about like, okay, should we remodel the restroom? Because sometimes it's, um, a razor's edge of of the experience, but sometimes when you're enhancing that 
something that's on the razor's edge, sometimes it's for nothing more than your own mindset. Mm-hmm. It, it, it creates the culture in the restaurant of nothing's off limits. Think about, think about the soap, think about the incense or the incense, the scent sticks, you know, is it the right smell when they walk in? And so I think to a certain regard in, in my mind, I think there's a place for both. There's, there's a, there's a place for exceptional food that I think I want to go there and I want to eat there every single day because the food is delicious, but there's also a place where maybe the food isn't so great, but it's good food, but everything else like the, you know, I want to feel, I want the pomp and circumstance. I want to roll up as a baller. And is that a three star restaurant or a one star? I don't know. And that to me, to me, it's like, I've been lucky enough to eat at one stars, a bibs at two stars and three stars. Mm Mm-hmm. And I agree with you. It's like the detail, it's at that point, it's like it's service wise. Yeah. Because you know where the cook that is working the saute station at a three million star is putting their mise en place at the end of the night mm-hmm. in the same Cambro that the Bib Gourmand, that the one star, that the two star puts it in. Mm-hmm. The only thing that's different is the service, in my opinion. At, at a certain point, like the food can only be so good. Right. And it's all about the rest of the theater. Right. And to me, I, I'm more passionate about the food and having a healthy, successful restaurant that is busy constantly year round than something that is so special that you only go once a year, once every other year. It's, That's just my personal No, no. Take. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good point of view. I, I think it's um, when people are in it just for the stars. So I, I talk about this on the podcast, the, the one that you're referencing. It's like you could do all this and then hope and then, hope. Gonna, and then nothing. And then the restaurant closes and you're out of business. Right. So, man, it's a slippery slope to and say that's what I'm worried about. Yeah. Like to, if you're if you're cooking just for the star and anyone that has Michelin stars that I know, that's a friend of mine, will tell you the exact same thing is like focus on making a great restaurant. Don't focus on the stars. Focus on making a great restaurant. That's what they all say. And it's true, because if you just are solely curating an environment thinking that it's going to get a star. I mean, like you, like you were saying earlier, Michelin might be pivoting and no one knows. All these lists, right? You yeah. know what's the most important list in a restaurant? Full restaurant. The reservation list. Yeah, there you go. That's the most important one. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but do you want a Michelin star? I mean, it would be nice, <laughs> right? but it's not going to make is it, me... Is it on your fed mean bucket list? No, no, not on my bucket list. It would be a nice addition. And I like... To me, like, awards and recognition are a byproduct of the things that we do, not the reason why we do the things we do. Mm-hmm. It's well said. When I first started Chef's PSA, I would I have a, a personal Instagram account, right, which is now private. I don't, it doesn't really exist because uh, because if people knew me in real life, like, I like jokes and I'm funny. Um, so if they'd follow that, they'd be like, this is not this is not the culinary content we want, right? Um, but... I first started doing chef's PSAs and I would put them up on my Instagram stories and it was just like for my friends and for jokes. I didn't intend anything with it other than to make a couple of people laugh and maybe call out some bad behavior. Um, but you were the first one you messaged me and you're like, Hey, turn these into a book and I'll buy it. And, um, I thought, well, how hard could it be to write a book? And you did. I did. I was like, so I'll start, I started the chef's PSA page. I wrote the book, uh, for people that don't know the first book I ever wrote, uh, is how not to be the biggest idiot in the kitchen. And it's like the original 51st Chef's PSAs that I ever wrote. Um, and the book's dedicated to you, for people that don't know. Thank you. Like, uh, uh, you're welcome. I don't remember what I wrote, but it was something like, you know, Fed Mean's DM. And uh, he was the inspiration behind this book. Because if you hadn't messaged me, I'd still just be posting shitty memes yeah, on, right. on my own, right? Um, but no, it's, it's a true story. But uh, so I want to... For people that don't know, this is the man that nudged me to go start Chef's PSA and write the first you book. You did it all. And then yeah, you did but, it. But but like I said, I never wrote well, a book. Well, no, I think like I was really drawn to that in a way that it's like it was geared towards cook and chefs. It wasn't geared to like the the general population. It was very unique to what our industry needed at the time. And I think it's awesome what you've done. I was just listening on the way here, the one that you just did with all the culinary students, mm-hmm. I can't think of another podcast right off the top of my head that's in the food industry that like has given the microphone to those people. And 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 you're like, 
maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but like you're taking more into a mentorship role for yep. all these people that might not necessarily have the opportunity to like have that person in 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 their kitchen or maybe they're thinking about going to culinary school, right? I think that's that or maybe going into cooking, like not even just culinary school. And I think that's important to have in our industry because there's not a lot of those things mm-hmm. happening right now. Well, I'll tell you what, when I first started Chef's PSA, it was like I said, it was for it was for you. It was for my friends. And for shit talking. And it was for talking shit. It wasn't intended for anything. Um, it wasn't. It was intended more for laughs with some education. But the people that I was targeting were all my friends that all kind of understood. Like, we all think like this. We all kind of talk like this. Um, and when I started Chef's PSA and it started getting bigger, I realized that the people that I was in my audience weren't the people that are necessarily in in these kitchens of my friends i had opened it up to a whole new world that maybe didn't fully understand the sarcasm in some of the posts that i was making so i had to i had to repackage it a little bit to say oh we're not here like i'm speaking with a one size fits all all the time but it's, there's some gray in there and i mm-hmm. like when i say I don't, I don't know if i say don't wear chili pepper pants and they're like, how dare you say that? It's like, well, I really don't care. Like, if you want to wear chili pepper pants, I truly don't care. I'm just saying, like, if you were in these restaurants with these chefs, most likely you don't want to wear chili pepper pants. So I've adjusted this because what I realized is you and me, we're going to sit down. We're going to have this conversation on the air. We're going to have another conversation off the air. And there's going to be a lot of other chefs, uh, a who's who of chefs that we're going to have conversations with that no one's ever going to hear. No one's ever going to be in the room. And no one's going to ever understand the way that these chefs think because they're, they don't have access to them. They don't have access to the mentorship. It's easy for you to pick up the phone with a Michelin star chef and shoot the shit. But to the cook that's coming up, I recognize that they don't all have that access. So this podcast, the whole Chef's PSA, the books and everything else, was intended to invite them in, to, to make it more inclusive um, for everyone that's in the culinary industry. Like, hey, come join the gang, even if it's at a distance. Come mm-hmm. join the gang. See what we're talking about. Talk some shit. Have some fun. Uh, take it easy. Not everything I say is intended to be 100%. It's the only way. Well, like, you give good advice. Like, and you are very good at giving the advice that is not necessarily out there. And you're very good with the words and how you're choosing to communicate that. To where, like, you're not being a dick, but you're not also, like, being too soft on people to hear the things that they need to hear. Right. And I think, for me, it hit me where the podcast was or is. When you started coming to the restaurant and cooks would be like, is that the chef's PSA guy? Uh, and I'd be like, oh, yeah. I guess like the, the audience is like way bigger than, than it was when, when you just started. And that's amazing to see. I'll, Congratulations. I'll, I'll tell you. It's uh, Jake, Chip, Maiden, the biggest podcast. In the, the universe. In the universe. The universe. Billions of people listening. Um, no, but it, it is big. And, and it's funny because when I go to restaurants now and I talk to chefs, um, you know, if friends or friends are just, I uh, happen to go to a restaurant, um, because I'm traveling. Sometimes I sit by myself in the corner. I'm kind of like, I don't want anyone to see me. Um, and someone will come up to me like, are you chef's PSA? It's like, well, I have a name. It's Andre, but yeah, that's me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely been interesting because I was always like a C minus celebrity chef, C minus maybe, maybe, maybe when, when, maybe when people C-minus. don't know your name, yeah. but they know the brand that you associate that you made it. Yeah. Yeah. So now like, I don't even have a name anymore. It's, oh, your chef's PSA. Someone messaged me, um, yesterday, but when this comes out, it won't be yesterday. Someone messaged me yesterday on Instagram. I do my Sunday Q and a, and, uh, they're like, wow, I've been following your page. I didn't know you were a real person. I thought you were a bot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you love that. I was like, no, I'm a real person. But, uh, anyway, it's an honor to people think I'm a robot. They didn't know how to real. No, it's amazing it. what you yeah. build and, and very thankful to be a part of this. Uh, today. Well, like I said, you nudge, you nudge me. So for, for people that are listening, I want to give like, uh, chef Ed means chef's PSA, chef's so, PSA, chef's PSA. So like, if you had a chef's PSA out there, like what to stop doing or what people need to start doing, what would you say? I thought about this yesterday in the phone call where you're like, we got to fucking prepare for this podcast. And, and I think one, I have kind of two, right? I think the first one is show me, don't tell me uh-huh. telling me, can only open the door so far on a resume before i met you i have this many years experience i've worked at grill showing me is going to keep the door open and it's going to pull out the red carpet you see all these people now trying to tell you all these things that they want all these things that they've done mm-hmm. but they don't really show you right. right 
So words speaks louder than mouths. I mean, than words. People have said that for a lot of years. Show me, don't tell me. You know, don't, don't, don't tell me you want to work the grill. Show me you're hungry to move on stations and work the grill. Don't tell me you want to be a chef. Show me that you can fill out a prep list, that you are actively looking at what's ahead of you. Those things are, are, are way better than telling me something. If you could go back early in your career when you were a new cook, what advice would you have wished someone told you when you first stepped into the kitchen? Uh, I think I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> Yeah, what uh, you mean, like physically? Physically, yeah. yeah. I, it's like this like balance, right? Of like, you're young, you can afford to be broke, you can afford to like treat your body not so great. You heal like Wolverine. But then, but yeah, but then like all those, all those bad decisions end up taking account. So it's like trying to find that balance mm -hmm. and um, not losing yourself in the process. If, um, if someone wanted to work in your kitchen, what would be the best way for them to get their foot in the door? Honestly, the best people that have, have been or are a part of the restaurant right now, uh, the restaurants, it's people that reached out to me just like cold emailing the generic hola at este, hola at suerte, hola bartotti. Like those are the people that have now been in leadership roles when we were in hiring and they just started opening a conversation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people that reached out to me on 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 social media, hey, I've always wanted to like be a part of what you're doing. Uh, are you hiring? Right? Um, that is the best way to get in the kitchen, other than like replying to an ad. If you had to think about like the most iconic dish ever created, someone asked me this yesterday, so I thought well, I'm going to ask you this. If you think about the most iconic dish ever created, there's a lot of them, right? You could say the beef Wellington, the Caesar salad. You know, Thomas Keller's oysters and pearls, right? Maybe it's the potato scales from uh, Paul Bocuse. What is the most iconic dish ever created for you? Tortillas. There you go. You knew it. Yeah, I knew it. Like, like we should end it right there, but we're not going to end it right there. So, Chef, uh, where can people find you if they want to know uh, more about you and, and follow along the journey? Uh, my personal social media, at Cheap Nunez. Uh, mm -hmm. The restaurants, at Suerte ATX, at Este ATX, at Borto ATX. You come on whenever you want. I'll, I'll be here whenever you want me <laughs> yeah. or invite myself again. Well, I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want more Chef's PSA, make sure you go to Substack and subscribe to get early access to all the podcasts, as well as a whole bunch of other things, including books, discounts on the merch. Go to chefspsa.com where you get everything, including the new book I just put out, Bad Cooks Everywhere, as well as the other books that I've written, Culinary Leadership Fundamentals, Line Cook Survival Manual, Bad Sue, Good Chef, Kitchen Art of War. Go check them out. And the very first book I ever wrote, How Not to Be the Biggest Idiot in the Kitchen, dedicated to Fermin, who was just a guest. If you're listening on Spotify, make sure you leave five stars. And if you're watching on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe button. We'll see you next week. Hit the porno music. No small drip in the kitchen. Mix it. Drop a chef knowledge. No fiction. Stirring up the beats. Heating up the session. Listen close. Class is in session.